Um, so our next speaker, if it's okay, is Dr. Christian Ogilvie. Um, he's an orthopedic surgeon at the university, and he's actually been the doctor for many of the people who are involved with brain sarcoma. Um, so we're really fortunate to have him here today. So um, I'm going to talk with the, some of the family practitioners at the spring conference, and I thought I would give you a little bit of the, what I'm going to talk to them about. It's um, the focus for them is going to be soft tissue tumors, but uh, bone sarcomas are definitely uh, something we worry about too. Soft tissue sarcomas outnumber the bone sarcomas about three to one, so that's something you're much more likely to see. Uh, the bone sarcomas for, have, uh, uh, the presentation is a little more straightforward because they really hurt and they're uh, often pretty uh, obvious on x-ray when you get them. Uh, the soft tissue sarcomas often don't hurt and they can go a while. Uh, people have a bump and there are different reasons people can have bumps. Uh, so it, it can uh, lull people just to sleep a little bit. So let's see if we can this from the side so everyone can see. All right, so uh, so we'll, we'll talk about lump pain or, or both as a presentation, uh, the natural history of some if we have time and how to approach a mass. Uh, we talked about bone a little bit, uh, but today we'll, we'll focus on soft tissue tumors and some evaluation treatment. So we say a oh, soft tissue tumor, that's kind of a really general term. What the heck are you talking about? Um, that, that it's, a, it's a very loaded term, it refers to connective tissue tumors primarily, and so that's muscle fat, uh, the synovium, that's the joint lining, uh, epineural tissues, uh, vessels, and cartilage. And the malignant ones, soft tissue sarcomas, we've got about 12,000 of them this year, uh, according to those who guess at such things. So that's a fair number, but bone sarcoma is, is uh, I think, uh, 3,020, so it's, it's a four to one ratio, actually. So you really need to consider soft tissue tumor for any kind of bump mass or unusual pain that, that someone has. And I, I'm really big on uh, differential diagnosis. And you think, well, that's what we have to do for everybody, right? But it, it's really tempting sometimes to say, well, that doesn't look like much. I'm sure it'll be OK. And then I think, well, what was your list of possibilities? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's really easy to let that go sometimes. So try not to yield to that temptation. So, um, so that's one, and then the other is, do things all fit together nicely? Does the story fit? Does the history and exam fit together? Does it make sense? Um, so as I mentioned, malignant soft tissue tumors, sarcomas, they're usually not painful until they're very big. And sometimes even when they are very big, they, they don't hurt much. Um, there's lots of benign tumors that are painful. So if you have a, a smaller benign tumor, or smaller uh, painful tumor, I'm thinking, oh, that's probably benign. Um, so you really need to be vigilant uh, about the, the pain, especially when it doesn't fit their history. So they really don't have a history of significant trauma. The location is not quite right. Um, it's lasting longer than you think it ought to. And, uh, and night pain can be a tip off, although there's a lot of things that can cause night pain and inflammatory things can as well. Uh, so do an exam. You know, you think, oh, they hurt there. I don't want to squeeze them. That might make them worse. But it gives you information. They say it's really painful, but is it tender? Um, so, you know, I really have this pain right over my thigh, but I can press on as hard as I want, and it doesn't hurt. Well, maybe that's referred from your back. Uh, so, so it's really, it does help you in your differential diagnosis. So if you feel a mass, uh, then you can pursue that with an MRI or x-ray, and then start to think about additional workup. Uh, as I mentioned, x-ray is really helpful for bone tumors. Uh, MRIs are a gold standard for soft tissues and uh, will outline those really nicely. So, you know, if it seems benign and explainable, at least uh, have them come back and, and make sure that it's going away. If you think, well, it's a hematoma, it's a trauma, you injured yourself, you strained something. Um, we expect steady growth from tumors. I just saw a guy today who said, oh, his back's been bothering him for four months. And he has a mass that's probably about as big as a small loaf of bread and his paraspinous muscles that he said just popped out two weeks ago. Thinking, yeah, that's probably not actually, but um, <laughs> you know, he's not seeing it or looking at it. Maybe his wife saw it or who, who knows. Um, and he says, well, it doesn't bother me to lay right on it. 
Mm, he probably had that for a bit then. Uh, and he's also had some intentional weight loss. He's been trying to lose weight over the last three or four months, and he's lost 26 pounds, and that's going to make it more stand out more too. So even like real reasonable, normal people sometimes come in that I just noticed this 10 centimeter mass. Uh, so that, that can happen, you try not to get fooled by that, but you expect a growth history, but eye tumors may or may not show that. If something's decreasing in size, that's generally pretty reassuring. Uh, it's, it's a hematoma that's resolving. Um, uh, hemangiomas, these benign blood vessel tumors can fluctuate in size, some of them depending on how active the patient is or whether they're above and below the heart. So things that, that, that fluctuate or decrease, that's, uh, that's a good thing. So the cancer soft tissue tumors usually become noticeable over several months. Um, some notes when they're, when they're large, as we mentioned. There's, is there exceptions to every rule? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so you, you can, nothing is, there's no all or never, always or, or never, and, uh, and uh, not even in, in cancer. So the synovial sarcomas and epithelial sarcomas are particularly disagreeable, especially the synovials. Uh, there's people, I've had people come to my clinic and say, oh, I've had this for 15 years and just started growing. Okay, um, and it turns out to be a synovial sarcoma. So they can sit around for a while before they uh, do anything. Um, and they have nothing to do with synovia, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a pathologist, come on. And they sit in there and they're eating something, they say, oh, that looks like a Cheeto. We're going to call that the Cheeto cell. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a pathologist. If, if you all want to go to pathology, I think that's great. I love pathologists, but that's, you know, it looks like something that they once saw or that they had for breakfast, and, and that becomes the name forever. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a challenge sometimes. Um, pseudotumors. Many of these uh, uh, things that are masses that don't turn out to be tumors are injury-related. So we say, hey, was it ecchymosis? Is it getting smaller? Try to get a history. That will help you out. Uh, they take anticoagulants. Like everybody's taking aspirin or some platelet inhibitor, it seems, right? Or if they're not, they're on, uh, they're on Coumadin, it would seem. So uh, they can get hematomas with relatively minor trauma, trauma that they may not even quite recall. I don't know if, ever, if you've ever had that. If you've been around in hospitals long enough, you bump into pointy things in the operating room and elsewhere. And you have bruises on your leg or something like that. Man, I don't remember doing that, but uh, it, but that happens it, even to the it, to everybody. So so um, that that may be the case that the history is a little soft, even if they have a hematoma. All right. So again, be vigilant. Pursue any of these soft tissue masses. The hands-on exam. Note the size, depth, consistency. The size you want to document in your note for your follow-up exam at the very least. How do you can how can you tell depth on a physical exam? Does anyone have any idea? They've got a bump, it's on your arm. How do I know if it's in distant subcutaneous tissue or if it's deeper than that? You haven't fired those muscles, and so if it's in the sub-Q and it, if all the muscles tense, you can still move it around. If it's in the deep tissues, it will go from kind of mobile to really fixed when they're firing the muscles. So you can get that on exam. Um, that's important because large deep masses are more likely to be malignant, more worried about them if they are deep or at least adherent to the deep structures. Uh, and, and you know other things, it's soft, kind of like uh, fat, fat uh, that's helpful. You know, lipomas are what you're going to see more of than anything else uh, in, in sub-Q. Is it compressible, uh, like a vein? It could it be a hemangioma? Uh, does it have a thrill? Is it pulsatile? Is it a pseudoaneurysm for that penetrating injury three weeks ago uh, in the palm of their hand? Is it, uh, you know, a big AV malformation? I have two patients, one of them I just saw walking around today, uh, here, that have just giant AV malformations, and you kind of, you know, there's compressible masses, and one guy put a stethoscope up to his back, and you can, you know, sounds, feel all this, uh, this turbulent flow is what you hear, and sometimes you can even feel that, that's what thrill is, of course. And uh, you know you don't want to stick a needle in that because you're gonna get, you know, arterial flow uh, right out in your exam room, that's no fun. So, uh, you know, to stay away from those things, we haven't even taken care of by interventional radiology, hopefully they can help out these guys. Anyway, but getting down, hands-on, can help you out quite a bit. Okay, so pursue these masses, bumps that don't resolve quickly, whether they're coming gradually or just been noticed, and they could even be painless, you can stay with them. Um, so I can say MRI is the gold standard for imaging, and if you suspect bone involvement, and you can get that out of the exam many times, 
than uh, x-rays, certainly. Uh, x-ray is not a wrong thing to do if it's just a soft tissue mass. It's just most of the time it doesn't give you a whole lot of information. You can get calcifications and some things like uh, hemangiomas and, and other uh, conditions, myositis. All right, so what do we do if we, you know, discover that it is a, sar uh, a sarcoma? The treatment is to get it all out, and, and that's uh, important to bear in mind when you're thinking about doing something here. Uh, radiation is standard, uh, whether it's done before or after. Uh, you do it before, you get a smaller dose in a smaller field, but you have wound complications that are uh, much greater if you do it beforehand. So it kind of depends on the anatomy. Um, I like to do it beforehand because uh, post-op, they get, uh, post-op radiation has more long-term consequences in terms of edema and uh, a tissue, um, uh, tissue scarring. So chemotherapy, this is a rough guide. There's really not a hard line on chemotherapy. It depends what the diagnosis is, depends how old you are and what shape you're in. Um, don't do it for everybody. Why is that? Well, it doesn't work all that great. Uh, and sarcomas is far from a silver bullet. That's widely practiced, but area of, of uh, development still. Okay, so as I said, the MRI, what do we get out of the MRIs? It's to help procedure planning. For soft tissue tumors, often it will not render a specific diagnosis. So I thought this was a diagnostic modality. Well, it shows the anatomy nicely, so it's helpful for me to know what stru structures are involved. Does the artery go right through the middle of it? I'd like to know that because I need to take out a whole segment and get that bypassed. Am I gonna have to peel it out and work on the nerve? Where is the nerve? Is the nerve sitting right on the top? Is it sitting underneath? Um, it, it helps me to be ready for that. Is it in the muscle? Am I gonna have to take out some muscle? Do I have to remove? the whole half of the distal quadriceps and the quad tendon. Maybe you need to transfer a hamstring up so your patella doesn't dislocate. Oh, but it's not in the muscle, it's in between the muscles. Okay, well I'll just shave out, you know. I need to be prepared for that. So it's, it's more of a procedure planning than anything else. Um, it is diagnostic for some things, benign fatty tumors. Perfect for those. Uh, sometimes it, the, the hemangiomas and hematomas, we can diagnose with the MRI. Um, Contrast, I would, if you're, if you're thinking if something cystic is in your differential diagnosis, give contrast. Uh, it, it's, uh, you, know, you gotta watch out with people in renal insufficiency, the radiologists like it. If you ask a radiologist, do you want me, do you want me to do additional radiology tests? Other eyes are gonna say yes. You know? uh, it's like asking a pathologist, would you like me to give you additional tissue? Answer 100% of the time is, why sure, of course. I, that's what I do is look at tissue, I would like more. So, <laughs> if you ask a radiologist about contrast, they're predictably going to say, oh yeah, that would be great, we'd love that. Okay, so uh, it, its value is debatable, but the more information they get, the more they uh, have to read, and the more confident they can feel about what they're saying. Uh, how sensitive and specific is it for diagnosis? Really debatable. Um, again, I don't expect you to get necessarily a diagnosis other than is it a lipoma or not out of your MRI. Um, X-ray can be helpful, sort out bone tumors, myositis, I mentioned flebolis we talked about, there comes synovial sarcoma again, it has some little calcifications in it 20% of the time or something like that. We don't use ultrasound very much. People love to get it because it's easy, and yeah, you can see, there's the mass, I felt it, you can see it on the ultrasound. Um, it's not giving me a diagnosis, it's not telling me a whole lot other than, if it, it's, you know, uh, it'll tell me flow, it's a big high flow uh, venous lesion. It'll help me with that. But it is rarely uh, helpful in procedure planning or diagnosis. Um, so it's not something that I order much. I think it's, uh, again, role is debatable here. So, so you suspect this person has a soft tissue tumor. Do you do the imaging now or you say, oh, I don't know what to order, what the specialist people order that when they get there? Um, personally, I can work with any MRI and the way that insurances are working you know, they're gonna want that patient to have the diagnostic imaging in their system and maybe they're coming from far away and MRIs have to be scheduled and can take a long time, especially if I decide to use contrast. And then I may not have much to tell the patient when I see them other than, yeah, you got a bump, we need to get an MRI. Uh, so I have no problem with that. I, I almost prefer people to come with MRIs. I can work with any MRI as long as it covers the entire bump. Sometimes you'll get it and the radiologist will say, oh, they need to come back and have a contrast sequence. You say, okay, fine, if, if you really want to do that. Um, sometimes that adds information, sometimes not. I, I, again, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, 
So feel free to get an MRI before you send them in. Uh, in terms of referral preferences, we do have a, a preference, and I'll go into the reasons in a second, that they get to a specialist at a center treating similar malignancies. Now you think, well, can I just send them to a surgeon and they're going to know what to do? Well, not everybody who, uh, not everyone's well versed enough to do a, a safe biopsy and excision. Uh, I would include orthopedic surgeons, general surgeons, plastic surgeons, and dermatologists. They don't always recognize what the ideal treatment is, and just because they have surgical subspecialty training, unfortunately, we're working on that still. But um, I think it's best off having an invasive procedure at a center that treats the, those, those tumors. Um, why am I so particular about that? It's because the surgery is a standard treatment, and if the surgery is messed up, sometimes there's a, it increases the recurrence risk, and if I have to take out more tissue because there's tissue contamination than I would have otherwise, then that's gonna alter their function, of course. Um, as I mentioned, chemotherapy, uh, don't really consider it curative, and radiation can help prevent local recurrence somewhat, but it's not curative either. It's about getting it all out surgically. Uh, that's our best opportunity to be rid of it. Uh, that's what we feel so strongly about uh, the, the appropriate procedure being done. So the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society looked at this uh, and they looked at, at biopsies and biopsies done at referring institutions as opposed to uh, referral institutions. Uh, biopsies and excisions done at referring institutions were between two and 12 times more likely to adversely change the outcome. Um, and then they, they looked at this at two different time points and they're probably due to look at it again. Um, they didn't they really, didn't really change, but up to 10% of the people had a change in their outcome uh, because of the, this biopsy or excision was done in a non-ideal way. So how can we get around that? The, the Swedes for many years have, uh, since the 70s, have had a guideline for uh, referring a mass to a sarcoma center. Um, and they said, hey, anything that's deep and anything bigger than five centimeters send it in. And so they have a, a study where they looked at the results um, and uh, they really did a pretty good job of, of picking up uh, the, the malignancies. Of the things that were referred in, I think there was, you know, we say that, uh, I think they had uh, three benign tumors for every one malignant tumor. I think, well, that's not very high, but it's still a lot of malignant tumors for a pretty rare tumor. So, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I think this is a nice guideline. It's not gospel. It's not the last word and what should be done. But I think it's a good point of reference that was fairly effective. And looking at their numbers too, I, you know, I, it shows that you know, three quarters of people with a sarcoma first presented to a general practitioner. Those people are seeing most of these malignancies as a first line, and uh, it's tough to be well versed in every uh, every rare disease. And like I said, a quarter of the people that got sent in wound up having a malignancy. So uh, they feel it's worth uh, referring all those people that, that had benign things uh, just to get them, just to make sure that we capture the people with malignant things and, and treat them in the most ideal way possible. Um, so what are the, what are the issues with, the, with sarcoma lung metastases? If it spreads, that's where it's gonna go. Uh, we talked about wide resections uh, and, and the, that they may alter function. Chemotherapy is uh, limited in how uh, effective it is, partly because, you know, 12,000 sarcomas, but there's like dozens of different types. So you, it's really hard to get a, a great idea of what works on any one type because, well, there's only 2,000 of them and they were in all different ages of people and all different body sites and all different places in the country. So nobody has a, and there's very few people that have a ton of them. So it's taken time uh, to, to find out, sort out what uh, chemo works on what and, and how effective it is in the first place. Um, we talked about radiation complications. So those are, those are the challenges that we deal with. Um, after treatment, we're watching people pretty closely for a while. I, uh, I'm doing a little bit different than this regimen right now. Every three to four months, the first couple of years, that's where we see the most events, whether it be recurrence or metastatic disease. Then maybe year three every six months, and then uh, years four and five yearly. Uh, you can you can justify going out to ten years. Things happen after ten years, but it's hard to justify routine follow-up. Um, PET scan uh, is being investigated as a as a 
means of uh, staging these people. Right now, it, the hope is that they can tell us treatment response. Are you one of the people that has a tumor that's responsive to the chemo? You know, we give you one cycle, does the uh, PET number go way down? The nice thing about PET is it's quantitative, unlike bone scan. So we'll look at how much glucose is being uh, taken up. And we can say, oh, you went from a seven down to a two after one cycle of chemo. We're gonna keep doing this. Uh, it's having an effect on that, the tumor metabolism. So we hope that that will correlate with survival. Right, that's what we really want to do, live longer. Um, so that's an area of ongoing uh, investigation. And it's, uh, there, there's some hopeful things. Um, there are certainly tumors that respond and don't. And uh, we gotta get the medical oncologist to be brave enough to the ones that don't respond to quit and say, and, and say okay, we're not gonna do anymore, go ahead and take it out. They still wanna stick with it and give chemo because that's what they do, that's what they are, that's their comfort zone. So it's very really interesting to see all these dynamics play out with the new, uh, uh, the new technologies as they come through. So, get a good history and exam. Get an MRI if you're worried about a mass. Uh, certainly, if you think there's any possibility of it, get malignant. Um, avoid operating on something or doing an invasive procedure unless you know how to do it without making a malignancy worse or if you have a diagnosis and know how to treat it. We get into trouble with people that, you know, there's a mass on the foot and you say, well, it should be a ganglion cyst. It doesn't transilluminate. I can't aspirate any fluid. It's really not acting like a ganglion cyst, but it's bothering the person. Well, it's gotta come out anyway. I'll just take it out. Okay, well, it turns out to be a synovial sarcoma. You did a marginal resection, which means you're right on the edge of it, which means I, I don't, there still could be stuff left in there. Uh, whew, all right, I've gotta go take out more tissue, but you didn't do an MRI ahead of time, and I'm not exactly sure what it, you know, how big it is, and she's only 19, so I can't mess around here. I need to be fairly aggressive. I don't wanna give her an amputation. Then you get a free flap uh, to cover that area. It's hard to swing bits of tissue over if we're missing skin subcutaneous tissue, nerves, extensor tendons down to the bone. So even in those small, simple things, they can kind of get messy. Uh, it would be so much nicer to have a needle biopsy of that, and then maybe she doesn't need a free flap. Uh, and I can be more conservative with the tendons because I see that they're not involved. But when, the, when the whole surgical field's involved, we're supposed to go clean all that out. Um, and then lastly, uh, the referrals, uh, again, we feel that from our experience in the past that uh, your best chance of getting the ideal treatment is at a center that treats the malignancies. And there's only a few of those around, but uh, we, we want to get them in to, to those people, ideally. Um, so if I had more time, I'd go through uh, go through uh, some examples, but uh, I'll wrap it up right there. I appreciate you giving me a little time to talk about bumps and bumps. I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. Thank you.